Okay, this uh, teaching here is going to be on, the title is going to be When Satan Attacks. And he does attack. Most of us don't realize what is from the devil and then what is from our own sinful nature that we have, that we live in. But this is what this teaching is going to be on. How do we take these attacks? In general, Christians live a defeated life because they don't use the power of the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. That's our first step, is to recognize that we have Jesus, which is the Holy Spirit, living in us. He is in us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. It says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in us. Who is in us? Jesus. Greater is he, greater is Jesus than the one who is in the world. And who is in the world? The devil. Our Lord is greater than him. And we know that. We do know that. But where we fail is this Lord, this Jesus that we know is greater than the devil. What we don't know is that he's living inside of us. And we don't use him whenever he does attack. We got to take that knowing and realize it realize that it's inside of us that we have the power to overcome Satan and his attacks I'm going to be reading a lot of scriptures like I always do it doesn't do you any good to listen to the scriptures that I give you if you're letting it go in one ear and out the other listen to the scriptures that I'm giving you these are the words of God this is our this is our strength this is what we live by we got to remember the verses and what God has said we have to storm in our mind, and whenever we need them, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we overcome whatever it is. So when I read scriptures to you, just don't let it just be plain words. I'm not telling you stories here. I'm giving you the Word of God. So listen to the scriptures. Listen to what they have to say for us, what the Lord has promised us through these teachings. Part of the reason Christians don't have that peace what the Lord calls rest. The part of the reason we don't have God's rest in us is because we keep forgetting who He is. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if ye will hear His voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Now the Lord is speaking about Israel here, back when Moses got them out of Egypt, and they were in the wilderness, and, and they had all kind of things happen and every time something happened well I'll show you through the teaching here first they were in Egypt they were slaves and the Lord said to Moses I'm going to set my people free I'm going to set them free and God told Moses this is what I want you to go tell Pharaoh these are the plagues that are going to come on Egypt if they don't set my people free now the plagues that God brought on Egypt was against their gods you know, the Egyptians, they worshipped the Nile River. So since they worshipped the Nile River, what did God do? He turned it into blood. They worshipped the man with a head of a frog. So since they worshipped the man with a head of a frog, God said, okay, here, have a few billion frogs. They worshipped the rays from the sun. They thought it had powers. So what did God do? He blocked the sun for three days. They worshipped the ground from where they got their crops. So what did the Lord do to the ground? He flooded it. He was shown these things that they were worshiping couldn't stand, couldn't do anything up against our God. He put down the gods, the, the things that the Egyptians worshiped. That's our God. That is our Lord. He showed them who was the true God. So then God took his people and Moses to the Red Sea. And when it looked like they were trapped, what did they do? 
after seeing the ten miracles, you would think they'd have faith in God and not even worry. Okay, we're here at the Red Sea, but hey, we just seen the Lord do ten miracles in Egypt. They were ready to stone Moses because they thought they were trapped. They forgot they had a promise from God. In Genesis chapter 50, verse 24, And Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land unto the land which we swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Right here it was said that God was going to take his people out of the land and take them to the promised land. But apparently they forgot this. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 17, And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Havites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. They had the scriptures. This was this was told in the scriptures. This is what God was going to do. But they got to the Red Sea and they figured, you know, God must have forgot because now here we're going to die. The, the Egyptians are right there. The Red Sea's right here. We ain't got nowhere to go. All we have is sticks that we take care of our sheep with. They got weapons. They wanted to stone Moses and Aaron. And Moses said in Exodus fourteen thirteen. Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. So the Lord, he opened the Red Sea. Again, a miracle. The Lord was there when they needed him. He was there. Right when they thought they were trapped, there was no way out. They were defeated. What did the Lord do? Did they even think about the Lord opening the Red Sea? That He could even do it? Even though they just seen ten miracles? Think about that. We have seen God do miracles. But then when it comes to our to our lives and we get to a point where we think we're trapped, we panic. The Jews, in their travel to the Promised Land, they came across some bitter water. It was bitter. They couldn't drink it. What did they do? Did they go to God? No. They wanted to stone Moses again. And God told Moses to put a tree in the water, and it was made good to drink. But again, they got to a, a, a place. They were all thirsty. They come across water. It's bitter. Oh, no. What do we do? God has brought us out here to the wilderness, and we're just going to die of thirst. See, that's the way we think with our fleshly minds. We have to stay in our spiritual thoughts. We gotta like the Lord says in Psalms to meditate him on him day and night. So when we come across situations, we're meditating on him and, and remembering what he has said to us and remembering the things he has done for us. But here the Jews was ready to stone Moses again. I mean what did they do? Did they forget that the Lord opened the Red Sea? A miracle? Did they forget that already? Apparently they did. Moses threw the tree in the water, and the water was made good to drink. Ah, uh, but, you know, by now, after this one, surely the Jews know that God is there and will take care of them and will see them to the promised land. I mean, come on, after these all these miracles? Well, a third time, this time there was no water. They were thirsty again. And believe it or not, they reacted the same way. God tells Moses go, to go strike a rock and water would flow out of it. And it did. But they did they learn? Did, did they learn? You figure, okay, okay, Moses, go to the Lord. I mean, there's no water here. We're all thirsty. We're, we're very thirsty. But we know God will do something. We don't know what, but we know He'll do something. No, that's not what they did. They're ready to stone Moses again. Does this sound like anyone you know? Does this sound like us? Whenever we come across hard times and Satan is attacking us and we don't know the way out, or we think we don't know the way out. You know, when I was reading the Old Testament, I seen the Jews do this over and over and over. I was like, man, what's wrong with y'all? The God has God has shown y'all miracle after miracle after miracle. 
And every time something happens, y'all panic. And I started thinking, I really can't say nothing about the Jews. Because I still do it myself sometimes. I used to do it all the time. But I have learned through the scriptures, the Lord will be there. Where before, in my younger Christian walk, I had maybe about 10% rest because I was worried about everything. Now, I can truly say I have about at least 90 or better percent rest in my life. You don't have to worry. Now, let me say something. When you're walking with God, when you're walking in the Spirit, you do not have to worry because you're in God's will and He will take care of you. Now, if you get out of God's will and you start off on your own, then be ready for whatever comes about. Because you're out of the umbrella, you're out of the protection of the Lord. You have gone your own way. Now, when you go your own way, then yeah, you better worry because you're not with God. But as long as you're walking with the Lord, you don't have a thing to worry about because the Lord will be with you. When Moses went to Mount Sinai to get the commandments, and he took a long time, well, the people down there at the bottom started in all kinds of sins. They made a, a, a calf, a golden calf, and started to worship it. They didn't have any patience. They couldn't wait for Moses to come down with the commandments. They took their eyes off the Lord and made their own gods. You know, in some things maybe the Lord has us go through for a reason. If the Lord doesn't do something real quick, then we start to panic and we're like, you know, he's not there. Moses was up in, in, in the mountain getting the commandments. And he was up there a while. People couldn't, couldn't wait. What's taking Moses so long? You know, right away their, their minds just went off and said, well, God has forsaken us. Let's make our own God. Now, if I was God, I would have gotten rid of Israel. I would have shot them all down. Because I would have said, and if you read, if you read the, the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and all, Exodus, uh, the Lord did want to do that. The Lord said he wanted to wipe out these people. And he said he wanted to start over with Moses. In Exodus 32, 10, he says, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. God was ready to destroy those people. He was ready to destroy them, because time after time after time after time after time, they would forget who God is. They would forget who was their God, who promised that he would t get them to the promised land. Who did all these miracles. God was fed up. And he said I will make. He told Moses I will make you a great nation. Now Moses. You know he could have fell into. Temptation. Of pride and ego. Because the Lord said. I will make you a great nation. Like Moses was somebody. But he didn't. He asked the Lord to give them another chance. And God said okay. But they would not enter in the promised land. They'll be saved, but they're not going to enter into the promised land. They're going to lose the blessing of the promised land. And what a miserable life they were going to have to go through for not putting their trust in the Lord. And a lot of times, that's the way we are. We have to be out in the wilderness because we forget who our Lord is. Hear the words that I'm saying. Hear what I'm saying about who our Lord is. And who is the one that can take care of us? Now another no faith in God from Israel was when they got to the promised land. They got there and they sent spies to the land which, was, uh, which they had other tribes living in the land which they called giants. Now they had a choice to make. They could take the land like God said, this is yours, this belongs to you. Or they can say, well they did. They said they were... That they're, there were giants in the land. There's no way we can take it. You know, you know, what are we going to do? Blah, 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 blah. Crying again. Forgetting who their Lord was and forgetting what He said. The Lord got very upset with them again. And again, the Lord said He had enough of them. And again, Moses had to step in for them. They were scared. 
they were looking through their earthly eyes and not their spiritual eyes. They saw giants. Did they think right away spiritually? Well, hey, that ain't nothing for God. No. They saw giants. They saw giants through their physical eyes. Got scared. Now God said, okay, you know, I'm tired of this. They will not go into the promised land. These, these here who are doing this, they are not going to go into the promised land. And the Lord was very angry with them. And Moses told the people, the Jews, what the Lord had said. So the next morning the Jews says, okay, we'll go, we'll go. And, and Moses says, too late. You done made God mad. Over and over and over you, you, you have failed to go to him. He has shown himself to you over and over and over again. But over and over again, you go on your own ways. So don't go to the land. God will not be with you. What did they do? They went. What happened? They got beat. They got killed in the battle trying to take the land. They did it on their own time. You understand what I'm saying? When God was there ready to give them what they needed, they turned away from it. And then when they wanted to do it on their own, they failed. We have to put our faith in the Lord. We have to understand that we're in a spiritual battle. And this rest that God has for us, it's a spiritual rest. What is this rest? The rest is the promised land. What is the promised land? The promised land is a land flowing with milk and honey, which being interpreted to us means our needs. The promised land now is our needs. We have needs, and the Lord will supply our needs. Whatever they may be, He will supply them. As long as we keep our trust, our eyes, on Him. We have to believe and trust in our God. We have to believe that He can do the things He's promised. And in a few minutes, I'm going to give you lots of scriptures. And listen to the scriptures I give you. Because these are promises. Just like God promised them a land flowing with milk and honey, well, the Lord has promised us several things too. Now, when I start reading these scriptures, receive them. Receive them into your heart. Don't just listen to them with your ears. Receive them with your heart. Receive it that this is the Word of God. One of the scriptures is Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. What's he going to keep us in? He's going to keep us in perfect peace. Wouldn't you like to have perfect peace? Some of, some of us don't know what perfect peace is. Perfect peace is not having to worry. It's putting your trust in the Lord. And whenever problems come, come around or Satan attacks, we give it to Him. We give it to the Lord and say, Lord, here, the devil has thrown this at me. You're my Father. Take care of it. That's having perfect peace. Not worrying. Knowing that you're walking with God and He's going to take care of you. We need to trust in Him. We're trusting Him that He saved us. Those of you who are born again believers in God, we say we're saved. Saved from, from what? We're saved from hell. We believe we're going to heaven. We have given the Lord our life. So if we, if we can believe and trust that He has saved us, then we need to trust and believe all these other scriptures that He gives us to live on while we're here. Second Chron Chronicles Chapter 20, verse 6. O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathens? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that, so that none is able to withstand thee? Our Lord rulest, rulest over the kingdoms of the heathens. That means God is... is is over lost people who, who want to hurt us. He's over the demons. He's over the devil. God is Lord. Lord of all. And none, listen to me, and none is able to withstand Him. No one. Nothing. Spiritual. Nothing can stand against our God. 
If the devil attacks us, Lord, help me. That's what we need to do. Because the Lord can. Listen to the scriptures. Second Chron- Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid, nor dismayed, by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. We see an army coming after us. An army. The Lord says, Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. The battle is not yours, God says. It is mine. When you become mine, when you become my children, and I'm your father, I will take care of you. He says, Be not afraid. Be, be not dismayed. For the battle is not yours. Is there peace in that? Think about it. No matter where the attack is coming from or who is attacking, we don't have to be afraid because the Lord will take care of us. In verse 17 of the same chapter, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you. O Judah, and Jerusalem. Fear not. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Stand still, he said. Stand still. Did he say to, to attack the devil? I'm a, uh, I hate to say this, but there's some religious groups out there who, when they pray, half their prayers screaming and hollering at the devil. The Lord didn't tell us to do that. In James, it says the best way to fight the devil is to get closer to God. Get closer to God. If the devil is attacking you, the best way to fight him is get closer to the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? you got to get closer to the Lord. If you're not reading your Bible, if you don't have that prayer time, if you're not praising or worshiping the Lord, I don't see how you can be a very strong Christian. Because we need all these things. So we can stand in His power, on His words. Stand. Not go out there and fight. The Lord says the battle is His. All we need to do is say, Lord, go to the Lord with it. And say, Lord, this and this is happening. We need to learn how to do that. Because many of us don't do that. Another verse is in Psalms chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek thee. The Lord is our refuge. He is our shelter, our protection. Did you hear what they said? That's what refuge means, shelter and protection. He is our shelter. He is our protection in times of trouble for the oppressed. Who is the oppressed? The oppressed are those who are crushed, broken, dejected, unhappy. But we don't need to be that way because the Lord is our refuge. He will protect us. Please listen to the scriptures. Please listen to what God is saying to you. If you are a born-again Christian, this is for you. If you're crushed, if you're broken, if you're dejected, if you're unhappy, go to the Lord. Lord, i got the spirit of unhappiness in me. Take it from me. I'm crushed because of whatever. I'm crushed. The Lord will take it from you. He will be your shelter. He will be your protection. Psalms 42.11 why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou, thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him, who is the health of my continent, continence and my God. I'm going to read this again, and, and this time put in the words that you can understand, so you can understand this verse. Why art thou cast down? Meaning, why are you discouraged, O oh my soul? And why art thou disquieted 
meaning uneasy or upset within me. Hope, meaning expect, expect thou in God. For I shall yet praise him who is the health, meaning salvation, meaning help of my continence, meaning appearance in my God. These scriptures, if we read them, receive them, you have no need to be oppressed. You could have that perfect peace. You could have God's rest. In Matthew 5, 4, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourn here means the grief of a, of a dead one. If someone dies in your family, the Lord will comfort you. I mean, it says, the Bible does say, it will rain on the just and the unjust. Don't get me wrong here. Don't think I'm saying, well, nothing's bad ever going to happen to us. No. We still, we still have to go through this world, and things are still going to happen to us just like the lost people. But we have the Lord to see us through it. I know. Some of you already know, but for those of who don't, I have a little girl who's 20 years old, but she's with the Lord. The Lord took her when she was five years old. She's not dead. She didn't die. The Lord took her home when she was five years old. She was my little angel. That little girl was everything to me. And the Lord took her home at five years old. She had heart trouble. And so, you know, she didn't make it. In this world, the Lord took her on home. But you know, I didn't turn my back on the, on the Lord. I didn't blame him. He showed me. He said, hey, I went ahead and brought her home. Pretty soon, you'll be home with her also. She just came before you did. He showed me. He comforted me with his words, saying, hey, she is not dead. She is here with me. She is here with me now. Praise God. I mean, I miss her. Man, I miss her. But she's with God Almighty. She's with the Father. She's not down here having to listen and go through all this yuck, junk life we have down here. She is living a perfect life with God now. And soon, I'll be with her. When I say soon, I'm not saying tomorrow or next year. I mean, I don't know when. But I live to be 100 years old. It's still going to be soon because, I mean, eternity is forever. But he comforted me with his words. This was my first child, my only child at the time. And God comforted me. I, I have proof that He comforted me because I'm here today. If I would not have turned to the Lord, if I would not have known the Lord, I probably would be dead or if I was still here, I'd be a drunk or a drug addict. Because that's the way I would have handled it. I would have turned to liquor or drugs. But being I was a born-again Christian, the Lord carried me. Praise God. Luke 7, verse 13. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. I'm using this verse just to show that our Lord has compassion on us. He has compassion on us. He's not a God that doesn't care. Hey, okay, you're on your own. No, God has compassion he loves us. Think about it. God Almighty, the Lord who created the heavens and the earth, has compassion on us. Those are good words to hear. Those are words that I have to hear that my God has compassion and for all of us. God loves you. If you out there and you think no one loves you, read the scriptures. God loves you more than anybody that you know here on earth. He loves us. He has compassion on us. That's good to know. That is very good to know. The Lord loves me. The one who raised Lazarus from the dead. Who had the power to raise Lazarus from the dead. That God loves me. The God that opened the Red Sea loves me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8-10. through 10, I'm going to be reading this out of the Living Bible because it was a little bit easier to understand. But it says, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but not crushed and broken, 
we are perplexed because we don't know why things happen as they do. But we don't give up and quit. We are hunted down, but God never abandons us. We get knocked down, but we get up again and keep going. These bodies of ours are constantly facing facing death, just as Jesus did. So it is clear to all that it is only that it is only the living Christ within who keeps us safe. I can read these scriptures and and, and just have total peace. Doesn't that sound like what you go through sometime? That there's troubles on all sides of you? You get knocked down, but the Lord picks you up and says, Come on. And I have a testimony on that too. See, I, I was a Christian and I gave my life to the Lord when I was 25. I'm 45 years old now, so it's been a long time I've been walking with the Lord. And so, yes, I have lots of testimonies. And the testimony I have on this right here is when I first gave my life to the Lord, before I gave my life to the Lord, I was pretty much a drunk. I was drunk all the time. Every weekend, all weekend. With some drugs inside of that also. But I was a drunk. When I gave my life to the Lord, the very first thing I did was was said, Lord, I want to quit smoking. I'm talking about cigarettes. Because uh, I had already quit in pot then. But I'm talking about cigarettes. He quit it. I mean, he, he took it away. He didn't replace it with a habit. I prayed from my heart, said, Lord, take these cigarettes from me. He did. That was the first prayer after my sinner's prayer to him, was to take the cigarettes. <clears throat> and he took them. Now, as far as drinking, you know, I'd go like about six months without drinking, and then boom, I find myself out, out at the bar getting drunk. Well, the next day, after the hangover, Lord, please forgive me. And I was serious about it. I, I was serious. I was not playing the game. I, Lord, please forgive me. And he would forgive me. And then about six months later, boom, he'd knock me down again. He kept, and when I say he, the devil, this temptation of, of, of drinking kept coming to me. The temptation of alcohol and the way I had lived for so long. The devil was like saying, don't you miss that? Don't you miss going to the bar and just having a good time and playing pool and just, you know, getting drunk? Don't you miss that? And after a little while, I would give in and say yes, and I'd go out. He kept knocking me down. But did the Lord abandon me? No. He would help me get back up again. Start all over. Keeping my eyes on him. And then after a little while, that was it. The devil didn't knock me down to that temptation anymore. I finally got the victory over it. Not I. Finally, I learned how to use the Lord on the temptation that the devil was throwing at me. Because every time, because I also had ulcers back then, so every time I wanted to go and drink, it was like, okay, I would look at my bottle of Melanta because I would have to drink a lot of Melanta because of my ulcers, or I would look at the Bible. And at first, the Melanta kept winning. Okay, let me just drink a lot of Melanta and blah, blah, blah. But then I started looking at my Bible, looking at the Lord. I put the Melanta down, and the drinking went away. This is what the Lord can do for you if you want Him to. If you want Him to. The Lord gives us a will. He doesn't make us do anything. He gives us a will. If our will says, Hey, I want to quit these drugs or alcohol, then the Lord will give you what you need to defeat the alcohol or drugs. He is with us always. It says He keeps us safe. And He does. He keeps us safe.